Hello and welcome to IdeaGen TV, powered by Azure and presented globally by Microsoft. Today, we are thrilled to welcome back Dr. Peggy Polonis, president of ACS Athens, as she leads up an incredible power panel titled The Future of Education as part of the IdeaGen TV Cloud, AI, and Innovation 2030 Summit Series. Dr. Polonis, welcome. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, IdeaGen, for having us here today to discuss one of my favorite topics, a hot topic nowadays across the world, the topic of education. Why it's changing, how it's changing, what the future holds, and how educational institutions are also changing to respond to the transition. Artificial intelligence guides our lives in many ways, and innovation is inevitable in response to these developments. While much emphasis is being placed on higher education institutions to prepare tomorrow's active citizens, the K-12 environment is also responding impressively. Joining me today are leading educators from the K-12 environment. But of course, this discussion would not be complete without the students who are preparing to be active citizens of tomorrow. I'd like to introduce our panel today, starting with Spiros Arsenikos, who is a chemist, an environmentalist, who teaches chemistry and technology at the American Community School of Athens, who has done much work on sustainability, is ve very well versed in creating and developing e-learning courses in science and mathematics, and is currently developing an artificial intelligence framework for kindergarten to 12th grade students. Welcome, Spiro. Hello, thank you. Vasilis Krasas, a junior in high school who entered ACS Athens on an academic scholarship and switched from a different system. Vasilis has placed seventh in a national physics competition and will be representing the team from Greece in the United States in an international youth physicist competition. Welcome, Vasily. Hello, thank you. Kathy Macropoulos, director of Montclair Children's School in New York, a preschool for children ages two to five. Over the past 34 years, an educator of preschool and elementary school students, a certified international school administrator, and before joining Montclair, Kathy was the principal of the elementary school at ACS Athens. Hello, Kathy. Dimitris Kikos, a sophomore at ACS Athens, who came from San Francisco, California, uh, is involved very closely with the incubator, which we'll talk about in, in a few moments, as well as the Innovation Summit, which had participant schools from all uh, different places of the world. Welcome, Dimitri. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. And finally, Sofia Moros, our elementary school principal at the American Community School of Athens, who's leading innovation. She's been teaching since 1998 and began as a reading specialist. Hello, Sophia. Hello, Dr. Polonis, nice to be here. You know, everyone, change is a constant in our lives. With technological advances, the change is faster than ever. The question then arises, how and where do we belong? Belonging is a basic human need, as is the feeling of the, the need to feel safe. Now, feelings of belonging are enhanced when we master skills and we navigate and shape our lives to a large, a large extent. Now, these developments create a demand for higher levels of education and training that require more so than required in previous generations, and they place a greater demand on all of us psychologically, especially the younger generations, because they ask for a greater capacity in innovation, self-management, personal responsibility and self-direction. The workforce today, as well as life itself, calls on young people to understand themselves better in their world and at higher levels of mental complexity. Um, so the young children are asked to cope with change, to navigate change, to create change, and to shape change because they have to be problem solvers, they have to be able to generate uh, options, they have to be able to look at possibilities and conditions, and they have to become what we call architects of their own learning, because we definitely don't want them to be victims of change. So when a school is intentionally focused on developing conscious, reflective citizens, students can acquire the skills and the knowledge 
to ensure future success, but they also must acquire the values and the mindsets to make ethical decisions and work towards improving human life and living on the planet. Such an educational institution or such a model rethinks the school as a professional learning laboratory where a model of student develops. They develop a leadership identity guided by ethical decision-making. So I'm gonna turn right away to Speedos. And Speedo, could you tell us a little bit about you know, what is artificial intelligence in education in a nutshell? And why is this important nowadays in education? Thank you, Dr. Pelonis, for that question. Uh, there are many different uh, definitions uh, of AI out there, depending on uh, the source. We could say that uh, artificial intelligence is a human-like intelligence demonstrated by machines compared to what we have, the natural intelligence, which is displayed by us, humans and animals, of course. And it also involves uh, consciousness and uh, emotionality. Uh, we humans are working together with technology uh, at another level. We are interacting with artificial intelligence systems on a daily basis. Let me just refer to Siri. Uh, Netflix is uh, choosing the movies that we're going to see, that we're going to watch. YouTube is suggesting videos. And of course, Google Maps, uh, Google Maps uh, algorithms are telling us how to navigate in our cities. However, despite this uh, daily interaction, we don't even realize uh, that we are, in fact, interacting with AI. And of course, it's very difficult for us to understand uh, how it works. And this is uh, creating an AI literacy gap. A very common question we hear uh, at school, uh, outside of school too, is uh, will AI take over? Uh, is it something we should be worried about? We need to understand that AI is a tool. It's a tool like the, the steam engine, like the electricity or uh, the internet. But uh, it's the first time in human history that we have created a tool that is already making decisions for us. And uh, that means that we have to be conscious of this uh, tool. We need to understand its positive and negative uh, potential. And we also need to understand what the benefits of AI might be uh, in real life, but at the same time, what the disadvantages, the possible disadvantages are. Let me give you uh, a couple of examples. Uh, there was a study published uh, in Nature in 2020. The study analyzed the effect of AI on the sustainable development uh, goals, uh, uh, the United Nations SDGs. It stated that AI can enable the accomplishment of around uh, 79 to 80% of the targets across all sustainable development goals, but it may also inhibit 35% of these targets. Uh, an example where uh, a positive impact of AI was identified was uh, health, in health, through uh, uh, cancer detection in uh, early stages and even uh, treatment, and uh, also in uh, sustainable cities where artificial intelligence will support smart cities uh, efficiently manage their resources. But on the other hand, and let me quote this part, it was stated in this, uh, uh, in this uh, study that uh, inequality in the availability of technologies such as complex AI enhanced agricultural equipment that will not be available to, not for, to small farmers will lead to an increased gap compared to larger producers in uh, more developed uh, countries and economies. And this will inhibit the achievement of some of the targets of sustainable development goals, uh, such as zero hunger and even poverty. Another example uh, to talk about education is that we are uh, already using AI enhanced tools in education. And uh, as the algorithms behind the AI continue to evolve and advance, they will play an essential supporting role in assisting teachers and enhancing uh, how we teach, enhancing the classroom experience. 
uh, already AI is helping us diagnose learning disabilities at a very early uh, stage and uh, it is also suggesting remediation strategies. So we have to understand that AI is just a tool and it's up to us how we use, how we decide to use these tools and technologies. Thank you for that, Peter. And I know that you are very closely involved with some of the students in the school uh, in terms of their projects. But I want to go right over to Vasily because Vasily came over to uh, the, our school from uh, an, another system. And since we're talking today about, we're talking about artificial intelligence and technology, but we're also talking about change, particularly at a time where change was kind of thrust upon us with the pandemic. Vasily, what did, what did you hope would happen by changing systems and coming over to the American Community School? You changed systems, uh, instructional language, you know, cultures. What, what did you hope would happen here? That's so, uh, thank you for the question. I, yes, I used to attend the Greek public school from uh, until uh, middle school, until the whole of middle school. I always liked... Uh, uh, I, I like academics. I was I was interested in them, and uh, I remember taking part in some local contests. Uh, and as I grew, I took a liking to science to, to the sciences. Uh, and slowly, slowly, those interests started to become passions of mine. And uh, as I, I started creating uh, an ideology about uh, learning and uh, education, I started seeing that there are many opportunities that you can take advantage of and many people that just decide or don't see them at all. So I started looking at those opportunities with uh, sometimes the help of others. And uh, we could summarize this mindset perhaps as uh, taking advantage of the opportunities that arise or maybe more appropriately as trying to create the opportunities that you want. And this is partly the reason why I applied to ACS in order to get a scholarship. And the same mindset has now in the latest years led me to enrolling into the IB program with the courses that I chose to take. So to directly answer the question, when I decided to change the educational system, I was fully aware of the challenges that speaking a foreign language or changing systems and social cycles would bring. Nevertheless, I understood uh, that this change would be beneficial for me uh, and my education. So it really was not a difficult choice for me. Thus, this does not mean that the transition was easy, but the choice to come to ACS was quite easy. You know, Vasily, I think you demonstrate, I really liked what you said about not only taking advantage of opportunities, but creating opportunities, because this is exactly the kind of future active citizen that we're looking in developing, uh, someone who's really thinking about uh, solving problems and synthesizing information and applying it. And so creating opportunities is really exciting. So thank you for that. I'm going to go right over to Kathy. Kathy, um, you know, the little ones, uh, they really had a major change with the pandemic. Can you tell me a little bit about the role of technology during the pandemic for the two to five year olds in your school? Thank you for this question, Dr. Polonis. So we observed the educational system globally shift to a remote model overnight. And Montclair Children's School was ushered along with other K through 12 schools into the age of distance learning, embracing technology as the means to continue and sharing our curriculum and bringing our teachers creativity into the students' homes. So as an early ed childhood educator, I often make recommendations to parents about screen time for young children. And as you can imagine, I always stress the importance of opportunities for social interaction and limited screen time. So we were now compelled to have children use screens as vehicles to continue their education. And what we did is we approached screen time in a very mindful way. It was intentional and not passive screen time. 
We explored how to best use available technology to provide synchronous and asynchronous delivery of the curriculum to our students. We wanted to preserve the social emotional learning, allowing them time to connect with their teacher and friends. We incorporated physical activity during the day and lessons were used to engage students, allowing them to communicate, to learn, to create. Their daily schedules varied, of course, according to their age. For our youngest students, they were 15 to 20 minutes at a time. And of course, this was all in partnership with parents. It's very important, it was very important to us that our children needed to remain connected to their teachers and their friends during the time of social distancing, bringing some kind of normalcy into their lives at this time. We also used a digital management system that included shareable digital learning portfolios and learning resources, which also kept our community connected. And finally, I really want to emphasize that during this time, our teachers demonstrated extraordinary creativity in finding ways to continue meeting developmental benchmarks from a distance. They learned to engage with their students in new meaningful ways, which in no doubt will enhance their classroom practices forever. And how did the students respond to all this, Kathy? So I wanna say that young children are introduced to AI long before they come to school. They see interactions, like Speedo said, with Alexa, Siri, Navigator, when they drive to a destination. And at our school, we had started using um, computers and devices, but not in the way that a child would have their own device and, and talk to the teacher like they had to during um, the pandemic lockdown. So at our school, among other activities, we, a week in December, we participate in the Hour of Code. So the Hour of Code is a global movement by Computer Science Education Week and Code.org. And it's a great way for us to, it was a great way for us to introduce this into our curriculum and begin conversations. We, of course, use developmentally appropriate activities, and we learned about coding without screens. We focused on critical thinking and first steps to code exploration. For example, in one of our classes, the kids took turns playing the programmer and the computer, and they used activity mats with various movement directions like frog jump, tiptoe, jumping jacks, etc., to create a code for their partner to follow from one side of the room to the other. Our youngest children follow directional maps, bringing them to a destination. And this is really how we began to explain commands and following explicit directions to such young children. I asked one of the students who has an Alexa at home, do you think a person is giving you the answers when you ask Alexa something? He said, no, she gets a signal telling her the answers. He didn't really want to elaborate further. He just gave me a look like, what was I inferring by saying a person was answering for Alexa? So he does understand that it's a machine and not a person. Just as they learn from a very young age that tapping something on a device will open a new application, which is the outcome they're expecting. And you know what? Children of this generation are immersed in artificial intelligence, and I believe they probably have a lot to teach us in this department. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Kathy. Thank you. And uh, along those lines, I'm going to go right over to Sophia because, of course, the students here as well were affected by the pandemic. And teaching online uh, has been around now for over a year and a half and will probably continue. Can you say a little bit about how ACS Athens responded, the elementary school responded to these changes with the little ones? It's a great question. Um, the pandemic really worked as a springboard for our elementary school because it added to this momentum of the existing accelerated teaching and learning processes that we have in place. For years at ACS, we've been building on our school's learning management system all the way from JK to 12th grade. And although the digital platforms existed, we really didn't contemplate that JK through grade five would be exposed to that duration of the online learning because of the pandemic. So after a full year, we realized that online teaching and learning are here to stay and that we've identified the pros and cons throughout this time of the ways that we need to teach to young children. As we look ahead, our teachers are really paving this way for elementary students to balance technology in their lives. 
That means that students must be comfortable with the technology, as Kathy mentioned, which we know that they have some comfort levels, but they have to understand that it's a tool to access and complete their schoolwork while understanding the, how these technologies fit into the world around them. And you know, it's interesting, although schools can bring technology into the classroom, when you think about the designers and the architects of AI, they're most likely not educators and programmers by, by trade and then problem solvers. And here at ACS, we have a track record for taking something academic and morphing it into a life building skill that empowers students to become architects of their own learning and conscious citizens. So let's take, for example, we have a program called Dogs and Learning Program, where students are given the opportunity to look after and protect a dog during their reading or math class. At first glance, it might seem illogical to some to bring an animal into the classroom to teach. However, the skill of empathy and reasoning and being able to absorb um, what is happening with this animal and the child are as a quicker transition and the students respond to it more readily than anybody would expect. It's through the lessons, these lessons, that we teach fundamental skills of empathy where students have learned to stand up for someone that might not have a voice of their own. These are valuable skills in which will help junior and future generations to be fair and work towards building a just community. Um, until AI programs can teach empathy and build social emotional connections with young learners, a blended approach is absolutely necessary. Exactly going back to what Kathy said, like, you know, the kids have exposure to it um, and, and they know how to use it. We use programming to teach coding, critical thinking, and engineering skills such as Scratch, Hour of Code, um, and both of these are games and software um, that interact with student with um, that students can interact with and bring their stories to life through animations by applying coding skills to be creative, problem solve, and use logic. At the same time, while they're doing all of this, they have the conscious citizenship is taught with student reflects which helps students reflect and understand their impact, um, the impact that they have um, on their surroundings. Thank you, Sophia. Now I know that it's not just the teachers teaching to the young ones in elementary school and generally to students, but our own students are teaching to other students. And so that's what the Innovation Summit is all about at, a, at, at our school. And uh, Dimitri, could you tell us a little bit about the Innovation Summit and how you got involved in this? Thank you for your question. Uh, the Innovation Summit is an organization organized by the Incubator Council, which also manages the area that I'm in right now. The Innovation Summit is, is a two-day event where students teach other students. It's student-run, it's student-led. Its purpose is to show and teach other students skills that they would normally not have access to learn outside of school. For example, there have been uh, presentations on coding, ethics, sciences, astronomy, and music, all very diverse topics. In addition, another key tenet of the Innovation Summit is that these presentations should be interactive. They should not just be a one-hour lesson where the teacher is droning about some topic. Uh, personally, I've been involved in three innovation summits and I have taught astronomy, optics, and ethics. Now, my first presentation, which was, which was on astronomy, was admittedly not the greatest, but I'm improving. And I believe that through this process of trial and error, I am innovating and I'm also helping to spread lessons which would normally not be available in a classical class. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Vasily, if you could jump in uh, and tell us a little bit about your involvement in the incubator of student creative ideas and how does that relate to being architects of your own learning, as we say here in our school? Uh, yes, of course. So I was always interested in creating things or making projects and uh, that is a big part of why I was so excited when I joined, uh, when I became a student of ACS, because I discovered the incubator. Uh, many of the ideas I had before, uh, when I was in the public school, uh, I didn't have the 
the funding, I didn't have the equipment, I didn't have the support I needed in order to do them. I, didn't, I couldn't fulfill uh, these projects, I couldn't, I couldn't complete them. Uh, and uh, the idea of a program that supports student creativity is truly useful and knowing that in creating projects you learn and earn skills, it should be an essential part of ours and any school. Because of its significance, uh, that is why I want to try and promote the incubator among other students of ACS. Uh, because the more it is uh, used and the more, the more useful it becomes in this way, the more people that, that are involved in it, the more it gathers resources and it becomes even more useful. Okay. And I want to jump right back to uh, Speedos because uh, we're talking uh, about innovation, but we're also talking about artificial intelligence. And I know, Speedo, that you're very involved in creating an artificial intelligence framework from kindergarten to 12th grade. Why in the world would we want to do that? And how can AI be taught to kindergartens, kindergartens and you know, all the way to 12th grade? Why start so early? Why well, start early? First of all, uh, I want to say that I'm uh, very happy to see Vasilis and Dimitris. Uh, uh, I used to teach them uh, chemistry a few years ago, and they are evolving into the excellent gentlemen. So uh, this evolution is happening not only to our students; it's happening uh, everywhere. And uh, I want you to think of something. I want you to imagine uh, a five-year-old uh, today. Uh, this five-year-old today is going to be graduating, uh, let's say, in 2035, right? And he will be entering, he will be moving towards a uh, reality that, to be honest, we don't really know what it's going to look like. We can only speculate, we can only hypothesize what it's going to be like. Uh, According to the future of uh, jobs report of 2016, 65% of the children of children entering education today will end up in careers uh, that uh, don't yet exist. And uh, this ch these changes are a result of the rapid advancements uh, of the fourth industrial revolution we are currently in. Uh, we have been through three major industrial revolutions where, uh, in all these cases, uh, humanity had time to, 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 adapt, to adjust. Today, we as educators, uh, we have a huge uh, responsibility. Uh, humanity is facing far more uncharted waters uh, compared to uh, the previous industrial revolutions. And uh, this is because uh, the rapid uh, development of AI, big data, the Internet of Things, blockchain technologies, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the advances in nanotechnology and uh, biotechnology. These uh, advances and developments uh, have uh, outpaced our ability to absorb the incoming information and uh, uh, how uh, it has uh, affected the way we uh, can adapt to uh, these new realities. And this revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, is led by AI. AI is in the center of this revolution. Uh, the, this uh, revolution. Uh, we as educators, uh, we have limited experience with teaching or even recognizing the fundamentals of AI technologies. A AI in education, as a course I mean, uh, is usually found at the university level, uh, mainly in computer science, but uh, it's spreading uh, everywhere. Uh, it is of extreme importance that the educational uh, systems work on uh, creating uh, a learning experience that will encourage AI literacy. We have to help our students become uh, not only critical consumers of AI technology, but also it would be nice if we can empower them, if we can help them become creators of uh, AI technologies. Uh, but for this to happen, it is 
fundamental for these uh, for today's students to understand what AI is, what are uh, its functionalities and its limitation, but most importantly, uh, how AI will impact society and us as a whole, as humanity. Absolutely right. And along those lines, Sophia, I'm just wondering, what do you think about this? How important it is, is it for very young children to learn AI? Yeah, another great question. Uh, I think it's very important um, that young learners are exposed to AI. As many adults can attest to, I think that trying something new after the fact is really difficult and extremely difficult rather for adults, but young children don't have any inhibitions and learning, they, they, they just absorb things, they're like sponges. They take in new information and technology far quicker than any adult. Today's young learners are known as digital natives, aren't they? They're growing in a world with ubiquitous technologies, meaning that they're already thinking differently than the generations before them. The a digital native student thinks, learns, and understands the world around them much differently than anybody who has not been subjected to modern technology. When working with younger children, myself, and I, I see this every day, especially with the early childhood classrooms, that there's evidences of how they're interacting with technology. Um, we had a four-year-old the other day uh, it was right before lockdown ended and they couldn't figure out an answer. They were, we didn't, you know, they didn't have the school, the government wasn't giving a clear answer. So the child resorted to Siri and said, you know, Hey Siri, when is my school going to open? Um, because this is how she gets answers. And in another platform that we have for even the way that students are submitting homework um, through another platform that's digital, uh, they're creating videos and in, they're, they're creating these videos like they're, um, YouTube channels of their own. And the, at the end of their um, assignments, they'll say, again, this is a four-year-old student who says, like, like, like my video, click the bell button for more so we can keep in connect, we can keep connected. I think those phrases and those examples are really powerful about how they're, they're learning to work with a technology. But with that being said, I think it's also important for young children to understand the ramifications of AI. So while they're building these digital footprints, we had, it's our job to continue to, throughout their schooling, to let them know what that means. AI is going to be one of the tools that will be used in the future to keep them on track, especially with all the vast amount of data that's being created. And as Spiro said, the purpose of K-12 framework that's being developed at ACS is to help kids understand these concepts and to help them apply it in the environment that they're growing up. Yeah, using AI as a tool is really, really what it's about, rather than being controlled by it, but to control it. And so I'm just, I'm going back to uh, to Dimitri, because I'm wondering, Dimitri, what are the prevalent views about artificial intelligence among high school students? Do you, does everybody really understand AI and, and what some of the ramifications of AI? Or, you Thank know, you for your question, Miss, which I find very interesting. Um, there's a very famous psychological effect where many people start using a technology, but then they forget what starts causing it. And I believe that this is also the case with AI. What we see is everyone on their phones for a lot of time every single day. And we don't truly realize how much AI is being used to collect data, analyze data, and help us in our, in our everyday lives. Earlier, it had been mentioned that AI should be seen as a tool, not as a threat, something to be used, not feared. Uh, and I believe that this does, unfortunately, not perfectly align with the high school students' view on AI. Many fear it, and they see it as this peculiar black box natured robot, which, if allowed to become too strong, will destroy the world. Others believe that it's used for data collection and mass surveillance and all that. However, here at ACS Athens, we are very lucky because we are offered advanced theme and computer science classes through which we can we are being shed light upon this peculiar and new revolutionary technology. And for that reason, here at ACS Athens, uh, we young learners have the opportunity to truly understand what AI is and what it does, what it cannot do, its limitations, and its main fundamental concepts. And many of you, Dimitri, in high school are actually going as far as creating, using AI as a tool, and so I want to jump over to Vasily because I know that Vasily, you're creating a bottle with solar panels that cools and warms water. 
So what are your thoughts about this project and how did this come about? So yes, I have uh, a progress. Uh, I have the, a work in progress. Um, so we are bombarded with uh, we are bombarded with warnings every day. Here, like the world is going to end in fifteen years, or or many other things, like global warming, air pollution, ocean acidification, or climate change, and so many other potential environmental disasters. And uh, I wanted to focus on this introductory project on. Uh, our carbon footprint, which is responsible for for pollution, uh, global warming, and some other things. Um, so the main idea behind the the cup is that yes, we can make and we need to make great changes to our lifestyle. But the idea is that all aspects of the life of our lifestyle need to be uh, resourceful, need to be clean, they need to be green. And uh, this is why I decided to make a cup that does not emit anything and only uses um, solar power. In order to put into perspective how much uh, you would save from kilos of carbon being released uh, each year just from for cooling or warming some water, uh, a rough estimate would be one metric ton of uh, carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere just for cooling uh, some water every day. And uh, as I said, uh, this might be a small aspect of everyone's lives, but it's necessary that we slowly make this change as a, as a community. Yeah, Sophia, along the lines of what Vasily said, how do we, you know, make sure that students get to a point uh, where the high school kids are now, where they're actually creating, innovating, thinking about the environment, thinking about improving life and living on the planet? What, what are the ways to, to get uh, young children to that level? Um, definitely it takes a stimulating environment where students can feel confident to take risks and discover information for themselves about making that personal connection with what they're learning. I think one of the most practical approaches to teaching young learners um, is by implementing integrated lesson designs in, in the classrooms. And by integrating lessons, it simply means that teachers pave the way for students to connect and then they can identify patterns within lessons or a unit theme across the curriculum. Um, once patterns are identified, students can become critical thinkers and then they and quicker problem solvers. And as we say at ACS, you know, become architects of their own learning, have ownership to what they're doing. Um, from second grades to fifth grade, our teachers are working with these integrated designs uh, with the sustainable development goals and connecting through anything from physical education classes, literacy, social sciences, et cetera. Um, and by allowing students to bridge those themes, students feel empowered and they and take a lead to make more meaningful connections for themselves. I think that's where innovation begins. I mean, after all, you think innovative ideas are solutions to practical problems that come from a simple need and sometimes those needs are personal, so. Yeah, and, and I'd really like to hear a student perspective on that. So Dimitri, what do you think are the best ways to educate students about AI and how to use it as a tool? I believe that education is the key answer to this problem. Students need to be shown what AI does through practical examples. For example, through YouTube videos, students need to understand how AI collects data and processes it. Processes it. They can perhaps be also introduced to more advanced concepts such as neural networks, because the key challenge in AI education is changing the view from fear to utilization. AI is a tool. AI may be the greatest invention that humanity has ever made. It's just that now the time is to prepare our generation to be able to utilize and to exploit this new powerful and potent technology. So to sum up, 
I believe that the key to being able to harness AI is education, such as here in ACS, where we're very fortunate to have STEAM classes where, for example, we were shown examples of AIs being used in all sorts of different domains, including medicine, uh, the job market, uh, and all those which I believe this helped expand our horizons and help us truly better understand what AI is and what it can do. Thank you, Dimitri. And you're right. The key is definitely education. And so I'm just going to go right back to Kathy. Kathy, how did the pandemic spark innovation? And what are your thoughts about the future of education? Thank you for this question, Dr. Polonis. I have several points I would like to highlight here and piggyback off of what everyone else said in the panel. Um, we continuously need to identify and re-examine the goals of holistic education because the world is rapidly changing. We need to look at our goals through a different angle and lens. We also need to create opportunities for teachers to collaborate. I would love for us to create a think tank within a school and encourage innovation to take place where we can learn from each other in a safe space. We also need to educate faculty about artificial intelligence and collaboratively create developmentally appropriate practices to encourage and stimulate problem solving and critical thinking skills. And I think it's also very important that we continue to, to remind ourselves that all children must have access to continuous learning. We must ensure that they have the appropriate technology and Wi-Fi to support remote, remote learning when necessary. We also need to educate our parents about digital citizenship and the importance of modeling and guiding children in that direction. So for schools that do allow children to use ed tech, we must ensure that proper filters and firewalls are in place so that children can't access materials that are not um, approved in a school setting. And of course, for parents of younger children, and I stress this every single day, they must be present when their children are using devices. So I believe that the future of education is constantly evolving. The newest landscape in education will be one that embraces technology and innovation. And finally, I think we need to be prepared for this. Absolutely. And so I'm going right back to Speedo um, as a final question, because I know, Speedo, that you are involved, as I said, in the Artificial Intelligence Task Force for creating the K-12 curriculum on AI. But what do you see as some of those goals, and where do you see the future of education going? Okay, it's very interesting. I heard Dimitris talking about uh, AI uh, education and he was talking about computer science and STEAM programs. I heard Vasilis talking about his uh, own STEAM uh, project. Uh, I'm uh, actually experiencing or uh, hearing a lot of things happening in our elementary school uh, under the coordination of Sofia. Uh, there are some great uh, teachers there doing amazing uh, things. And of course, what uh, Kathy uh, said about the, the practices that are taking place at uh, her school. Uh, what is the task force? And I'm actually also uh, explaining why we need this uh, framework uh, I talked about uh, before. So um, the task force's main goal is to create a framework to put all these things uh, together under one uh, umbrella. It uh, consists of educators and experts from all grade levels, and uh, we work uh, closely. We work closely with professionals from all disciplines. Uh, let me just say that uh, we operate under the coordination of uh, Ms. Carla Panas, the dean of the ACS uh, Institute, and Dr. Adonis Karabelas, uh, a physicist and our uh, STEM expert here at ACS. So apart from uh, the framework, uh, our goals are to, to help educators, help faculty, help their students discover, explore, uh, and familiarize uh, uh, 
with uh, AI, familiarize themselves with uh, AI, uh, but not only from one perspective, holistically. And uh, only through a holistic approach will we be able to give them the tools to uh, harness, uh, harness it. I just want to say uh, the four main themes uh, of the ACS AI framework uh, that we're working on. Framework, uh, theme number one, life and uh, intelligence. We've been teaching life sciences at all levels. We can explore different types of intelligence through these courses. Learning is our second theme, how we learn, how computers learn and uh, how, for example, how pattern recognition and uh, computational thinking uh, uh, work and what it's all about. Theme number th three, perception and action. How we humans realize the world around us uh, through human senses, obviously, and how computers, how machines realize uh, their own reality, which is done through digital sensors and uh, actuators which means we're actually talking about uh, robotics there. And uh, last but not least, the, the, the fourth uh, main theme is the impact of uh, AI uh, involving uh, conscious uh, citizenship, uh, digital and media literacy, and of course, the impact of AI uh, in the UN's sustainable development goals. Uh, we explore these uh, themes uh, in all grade bands, from kindergarten to uh, high school. And uh, as you know, uh, the, the, the school schedules are extremely tight. So what we're looking forward to do is to blend the themes with other K-12 disciplines and actually integrate AE literacy in uh, core uh, courses. Something uh, that Sophia uh, talked about uh, uh, in her previous answer and uh, let me just add a few more examples to what uh, my fellow speakers said uh, in science and social studies we can use ai as a problem solving tool and students will be encouraged to uh, apply algorithmic thinking to solve uh, problems this way they can start to understand what our uh, computational uh, actually thinking is if we consider it uh, uh, if we consider ai uh, a teachable agent, then we can apply the learning by teaching methodology and this can help uh, the younger ones learn and socialize different emotions while at the same time teaching uh, machines to recognize these emotions. But this is important by actually understanding what they're doing at that point because we're teaching AI every day and we're not really aware of it. So. That's why it's important. And of course, as Dimitri said, in STEM programs, uh, we can help students develop uh, computational thinking uh, through building machine learning models and at the same time, uh, help them practice science, engineering, and technology skills. Absolutely, Spiro. Thank you for that. We may not know exactly where education is heading, but I think we have a pretty good idea of how to navigate the platform and it's incredibly encouraging and comforting to know that uh, educational leaders such as yourselves are guiding this process through research and reflection and creation and it's also incredibly empowering to know that students like Asili and Dimitri are not only innovating and creating but are also doing it through a lens of conscious citizenship. So thank you all for being with us today and thank you Ideagen for having us. And I look forward to more discussions about education in the near future.